The Religions of Man with Dr. Houston Smith. Last week we were discussing the Hindu concept of man's destiny as being union with God, and we're talking about the four paths to this union, the path of knowledge, the path of work, the path of love, and the path of psychological exercises. In connection with the latter, you may remember, uh, I went through the routine of the posture, which is normally assumed as uh, conducive to the mental states which they are trying to bring about. Uh, you remember it, the spine uh, erect, uh, the legs uh, folded in the lap, the hands too settled uh, in the lap. Now, ridiculously enough, of all that I said about God last week, uh, it was this mundane matter of the posture of the body uh, which seemed to have captured the fancy of the community. Uh, the globe had a light and slight little item on it, and the bulk of my mail during the week centered one way or another on this item. I'd like to uh, share with you one of the charming letters which I got in this connection. Significantly enough, uh, it's on a little note card which is, has printed on the outside just a quickie, and here is how it reads. Dear Dr. Smith, I shall be very brief, for I can't write well in my present position. I have my left foot in my right pocket and my right leg pretzeled around my left. How do I unwrap? I am eagerly awaiting next week's show, hopefully, Mrs. Edward Jones. Well, uh, this is a uh, whimsical note which I enjoyed very much, but I bring it in uh, for purposes other, other than that, really. I bring it in because it raises what is really a very uh, serious point, in a way. Although this is in a very light vein, uh, people do get into trouble in the practice of the yogas. They get into real trouble. They find themselves bogging down, not making any uh, progress as they feel for long stretches, periods of aridity they are sometimes referred to. And whenever this happens, whenever people get into trouble, this raises two very serious questions. One uh, is, will I make it? Will I get through to my destination? And the other is, uh, how long do I have to achieve my goal? Now, it's these questions that I would like to turn to this evening. In order to get the Hindu view on these questions, however, it's necessary for us to introduce some of the basic philosophical concepts in Hinduism. And that will be the task which is before us on this uh, third and final lecture on Hinduism. Now, let's begin with these two questions. Will I break through? Will I make my destination, which is liberation of the human spirit, union of the spirit with God, and second, how long do I have to do this job? I, it will help us to get the Hindu view on this if we look first at the Western religious answer to these questions. What do Western religions say about this matter? Will I make it? 
will I, to use the usual religious parlance, will I get to heaven? Well, the Western answer, as we all know, is some do and some don't. There's a fighting chance, there's a very good chance, if I put myself into it wholeheartedly, that I will attain the goal. But there's never any thought of inevitability about this process. Some are lost, and they are really lost, lost forever. There is in the West the concept of eternal damnation. There is, therefore, a kind of irrevocable quality about this question and the answer to it. As to the question of how long do I have, the West's answer, again, is familiar to all of us. I have one lifetime, the duration, the span of my present life, during which I will either reach or I will forever miss the goal of life. Now, these two factors, uh, the factor of the possibility of missing the goal plus the fact of one lifetime to reach it or to miss it introduces a kind of faithful quality to the Western sense of time. Well, this comes out in many, many ways in the poignancy that suffuses the West as it thinks of time. Whitehead puts it in the phrase of the perpetual perishing of experience. The poets are familiar with this. Snow falls upon a river, white for a moment, gone forever. This time consciousness gives a sense of urgency to, for example, 17th century love poetry. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, or again, while we are yet decaying, come, my Karina, let us go a may. Throughout the West, then, there is this sense of the urgency of time pressing in upon man always. Now, if we go to the East, we find that the attitude, the whole mental environment is very different with regard to this matter of time. Let's come back now to the two questions. Will I achieve the ultimate destiny, the highest destiny of my life? And the Hindu answer is, Yes, you will. There is in Hinduism no sense of eternal damnation, but in the end everyone achieves the highest goal of which his life is capable. I was uh, interested uh, very much, uh, one of the first years I was at Washington University, there was a Buddhist in the community, I was new to the community then, and I don't even remember his name, he's left. St. Louis, as far as I know, he came out to uh, discuss uh, Buddhism before a student group. I, I realize we're talking about Hinduism now, but in this matter, the concepts are identical, so it serves our purposes just as well that he was a Buddhist. I remember he was talking about nirvana, this concept of the highest goal, and indicating uh, its beauties, its glories. There was on the front uh, row a football player, a rather large, burly, uh, but interested in the matter. And after this Buddhist had completed his presentation, uh, this football player was the first to raise his hand for a question, and he was called upon. And he said, what if I don't happen to want to reach nirvana? And the Buddhist uh, replied, in that case, it will take you a little longer. Well, this is typical. Uh, it speaks directly to the Indic point of view on this. Uh, if you haven't cultivated the taste for enlightenment, this will take you a little longer, but sooner or later you will come to this taste, and in the end you will get there also. Well, we see then a basic difference with regard to time, with regard to how many will reach destiny, the human destiny? Uh, as to the question now of how long I have to reach my goal, again, the Indic question answer is very different from the West. Rather than being one lifetime, the Indic answer is that I have as much time as I need. 
Now, how can this be? Well, this brings us to one of those basic philosophical concepts which we must introduce into the picture this evening. It's a concept that we've all heard about in connection with India. It's the concept of reincarnation. What does it mean? <clears throat> well, look at the word. Uh, this carnate has to do with the body. And re, of course, uh, in is coming into, and re is again. What it means is that the spirit of man is not indissolubly wedded to a single human body. That on the contrary, the soul of man moves through, passes through a succession of human bodies. From the Indic point of view, a single lifetime is far too short to learn the lessons, the basic lessons which we are here in life to learn. It takes a number of these to accomplish that job. And therefore, uh, since the body lasts only a very short time, a number of bodies are needed. The concept, to put it rather crudely, is like that of uh, our body passing through a number of suits of clothes. When we wear out a suit of clothes, we don't figure that our life is through. We simply uh, don a new suit of clothes. Similarly, to carry over the analogy, the spirit of man dwells in a body, but when that body decays, then the spirit simply dons a new body. Now, what are we to think of this uh, concept? Is it something that, I, I don't say that we can believe, but is it something that we in the West can take seriously? Belief is, a, is another matter. Well, uh, I'm not here to argue the case, but I think it is worth noting that many of the great thinkers of the West have at least entertained this idea as a serious possibility. From Plato to Origen, from Blake to Schopenhauer, from Burma, Kant, and Swedenborg, to Browning, Emerson, and Whitman, these are some of the names in the West who, as I say, have considered this uh, possibility with various degrees of acceptance, but all taking it as a serious possibility. But we're not here to talk about uh, that, the extent to which the West agrees. Let's continue with the East. Why do the Indians believe in this doctrine of reincarnation? Well, I think they would put it this way. First of all, on theoretical grounds. People are different. So we come up against that stubborn fact time and time again. They have different capacities, uh, different interests, uh, different uh, moral conditions. I've known people that seem to have been born sweet, you can almost say, and others who just have a terrible time in life. Now, how are you going to explain the vast range of difference in human possibilities? We have musicians, Mozarts and Beethovens, who very young, without the elaborate training, take to music with great facility. Well, the Western interpretation is based on two things. First of all, the idea of environment and heredity. I would say that we in the West are banking our interpretation of these differences on these two concepts, environment and heredity. Well, here the Indians would simply say, well, that may be so. You may be right that those two could exhaustively account for these differences. But you haven't by any means proved the case and yet that these two factors can do the accounting job. And therefore, we would simply insert as a third contributing factor this residue of tendencies of inclinations which have been built up in some way out of past experiences. Now there's another reason, that's the theoretical uh, point I think they would want to suggest. But they would also, I think, say that there is a moral point too. And that is 
that without some sort of concept like this, it is very difficult indeed to argue to maintain the case for a moral universe because people simply uh, do not have the same opportunity. Some are born handicapped in one way or another and either you have to say this is just chance, someone got the hard breaks, either you have to just dismiss it to chance or if you're going to sustain the moral factor, you will have to say that somehow responsibility for that was developed in their past lives and also that what they do in this life will bring them, if they react to their challenge in a creative way, to a better condition in the life to come. There are then, I think they would want to say, two reasons for, uh, at least these two reasons, for entertaining this as a possibility. Now let me ask another question. Do we, from the Hindu point of view, do we return at once? That is, are we reborn? When we die, are we reborn into another body at once? And their answer is no. Here we need to really get a, a simple diagram of their view of the universe. It centers in this world as we know it, the world of uh, action, as they would say, this world of experience here and now. But that's not all there is to reality. Above this world, there are uh, finer worlds. These are also material worlds, but they are too subtle in their material nature to be seen by the eye or picked up by the instrument. Also, below this realm of action, this world as we know it, there are lower worlds. Now, when the spirit of man leaves a body from the Hindu point of view, if it has lived a good life, it will go to one of the upper worlds. If it has lived poorly, it will go to the bottom, one of the lower worlds, uh, where the experiences are less pleasant. But these upper and lower worlds are not worlds of action. You don't do anything in these worlds. These are simply realms of experience where if you have lived well, you enjoy the fruit of your action. If you have lived not so well, then you suffer the consequences for a duration. But after staying the duration in one of these realms, then you return again into the realm of action and if you lived well in the past life, you will be reborn with more favorable dispositions and tendencies. Salvation, however, according to the basic Indian view, lies outside of all this because this is all material. Ultimately, when liberation comes, the spirit uh, is relieved of all material encumbrances and then he enters into direct union with God. Now, while we're on this cosmology, let me just introduce a couple of other points about it so we can get the Hindu perspective. There is in the Hindu outlook what they call the day of Brahma and the night of Brahma. By that they mean that this material world isn't constant. Rather, it's sort of like a gigantic accordion. It will swell out and expand for a period, a long period, but then after having been in this expanded state, it will then collapse and go into what they call the night of Brahma or God, the night of Brahma in which it is in pure potentiality. It is latent. Now, uh, there are some very interesting parallels between this view and contemporary scientific views. I have here a little note from the Scientific American of last summer. And here is what this uh, note says about the universe. Thus we conclude that our universe has existed for an eternity of time, that until about five billion years ago, it was collapsing uniformly from a state of infinite rarefaction. That is, that it was uh, returning into this state which the Hindus would call the night of Brahma. That five billion years ago, it arrived at a state of maximum compression 
in which the density of all its matter may have been as great as that of the particles packed in the nucleus of the atom that since five billion years ago it has been expanding. I introduce this as an interesting item in itself because when one looks at the time chronology in the Puranas, the Hindu texts of thousands of years ago, they put the date, the duration of the current day of Brahma as being about four billion years. And this coincidence between their, their hypothesis of four billion years for the present outflowing state of the universe and the scientific view of uh, the Western world as coming to five billion years is a very striking, it seems to me, uh, convergence in the two outlooks. Well, we've talked now about the idea of reincarnation and the worldview which this presupposes. I want now to ask another question, and this is the question of what affects our destiny as we move through these various bodies. And here we come to a second key term that we must introduce to the picture, and this is the concept of karma. Karma, briefly, is the law of cause and effect, as this pertains to the moral and spiritual realm. This is something we're very keen about, cause and effect. Our Western science has made us very alert to ideas of cause and effect. Well, the Hindus here are extending this law, applying it uh, to the realm of man's moral and spiritual life as well. Well, we do the same thing. We have in our own tradition such phrases as, as a man sows, so shall he reap. We add to the idea, sow a thought and reap an act. Sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit and reap a character. Sow a character and reap a destiny. Well, this is essentially the idea of karma. But they carry this to absolutely complete terms. And what I mean by that is, they would say that a man is fully responsible for his present condition. Where he is in his present state is the result of where he, what he has thought and what he has done in the past. People, they say, are constantly trying to, uh, what the psychologists call, project. They project the blame upon people outside of themselves. They're reluctant. We're reluctant to take responsibility for our acts or for our deeds. But according to this doctrine of karma, or the universal law, moral law of cause and effect, we can't blame anyone else ever for our condition because our condition has been built up by what we have thought and what we have done. Every act has its equal and opposite react upon us. Every action that we perform on the external world is a kind of chisel blow on our character, building it, shaping it according to the way in which we uh, deserve to arrive because of how we have lived. There is then, in this view, no room for counting on the breaks in life. Here again is what people, how many people go through life uh, waiting, waiting for some great moment when the breaks will come to them, when they will be called up on the quiz program and will give the right answer and $5,000 or something will come tumbling into their lap. If you live waiting for the breaks, the Hindus would say, you miss the purpose, you miss the point of life because ultimately nothing depends on the breaks. Their, their fundamental assertion on this point is there is no chance for accident. All right, now, uh, these then are two of the key ideas which underlie 
the Hindu concept of life and religion. Let me now, uh, as we come into the closing minutes of this uh, third and last lecture on Hinduism, try to recapitulate some of the basic theses in their religion. First of all, the Hindu view of God. Ultimately, God is infinite. He is beyond all we can think or even dream. But this doesn't help too much because we need to imagine him. We need to think of him in some way. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the uh, British literary figure, uh, says something very pertinent on this point. He says that when he was small, his parents asked him, told him, as a matter of fact, to think of God in, in, as infinite because all forms would limit him. He said, I, I tried, I tried as hard as I could, but the closest I could come to thinking of infinity was an infinite sea of gray tapioca. Well, the Hindus would say, would agree. Yes, the mind reaches out after symbols, and there's nothing wrong in that. And therefore, it's all right to symbolize God. Here is one symbolization uh, right here, the figure of Shiva that we've seen many times. It's all right to think of these images, but they must be reminders of God. As the Bhagavad Gita says, the countless gods are only my million faces. Ultimately, the highest symbol is this symbol that we have encountered before of Om, signifying infinite existence, infinite awareness, infinite bliss. This is God. Now, next, the Hindu idea of salvation we have seen is union with God. There are, however, two ways in which this union of the spirit with God is conceived in Indian religious thought. One is the idea of complete merger. The image here is of a salt doll who went down to test the temperature of the sea. He plunged in and uh, he dissolved. So too, the spirit of man in one view merges completely with the infinite. The other view is it retains a slight distinction, and as they say it in that form, I want to taste sugar, I don't want to be sugar. Well, this, in uh, a few brief, three brief and inadequate lectures, I have tried to distill the results of about a decade of trying to understand the Hindu outlook on life. Only uh, I could be fully uh, aware of how sketchy, how inadequate has been. Some of you will leave the matter here. Some will have been stimulated to look further for yourself. But tonight, as we leave Hinduism, let me close with the climactic assertions of this religion. Atman is Brahma. The soul of man is divine. That art that, as the Upanishads put it, he indeed, the Lord who pervades all regions, it is he again who is born as child and he will be born in the future. He stands behind all persons and his face is everywhere. The self-luminous Lord who is in fire, who is in water, who has entered into the whole world, who is in plants, who is in trees, who is in the heart of every man, to that Lord, let there be adoration. Preceding program was distributed by the Educational Television and Radio Center. This is National Educational Television.